one, one question first and then the second question. So we'll try and spend about half the time on each of those questions. So the questions, uh, number one, how do you negotiate different aspects of diversity in your approach to preventing violence against women? And the second question is, how do you demonstrate crime and prevention efforts are delivering change? Simple questions that we should be able to nail. <laughs> <laughs> so the first question, how do you negotiate different aspects of diversity in your approach to preventing violence against women? We'd like to begin. But Karen's looking at me, so she will. <laughs> yes. um, I'd like to, well, maybe answer this by talking a little bit about um, a program that Women with Disabilities Victoria are developing. Um, we do have violence against women with disabilities as a priority because, as you've heard, um, the disability compounds the likelihood of being targeted for violence. Um, and so we have looked at how we might develop violence prevention for women with disabilities. And have been for a long time very aware that uh, within the disability sector, there is very little discussion or discourse around gender. The focus of um, the disability sector is the disadvantage that people with disabilities experience. So the concept of intersectionality is very new. And we were very conscious that if we wanted to have some impact on um, the effects of violence on women with disabilities, we needed to start by raising awareness in the disability sector and to start with gender sensitivity. So we've developed a program called the Gender, well, we call it the Gender and Disability Workforce Development Program, of course. And um, it's really about um, what gender has to do with providing a quality service and awareness of gender being essential because people with disabilities are often not seen as sexual, therefore not seen as um, different by virtue of their sex. Um, and I could give examples, but I don't think I've got a lot So um, what we've done is developed a, a program for delivering um, training around these issues to disability workers and education around the issues to women with disabilities within two disability organisations in Victoria. And we had to think about what that might mean from a whole range of um, diversity perspectives. Firstly, um, we wanted to walk the talk in how we delivered it. So we have developed training that co has co-facilitators who have professional expertise around family violence and uh, violence prevention, and um, women who have expertise around their personal experience of disability. And um, together, PAIR, they have been providing the training to the disability sector. So in terms of diversity, that in itself is modelling what we want, but we also have diversity around race, around um, sexual preference, um, around rural and metro women within those trainers and a whole host of diversity, which is made for an incredibly rich um, trainer trainer program and a really exciting um, uh, discussion that's happened. And women in it have talked about it being transformative. Uh, in terms of how we've delivered that to um, the disability workforce, the disability workforce itself is very diverse. So we have, um, people who are newly arrived immigrants who can't get other work, who are able to get work as direct service workers, who may not have you know, English literacy. Um, and then we have uh, the executives within the organisation who have probably got tertiary education and are working in, you know, in abstract terms all the time. So we wanted to have a training program that was meaningful to all of those people within their different diverse experiences. And so we have very much focused on an experiential approach. And that's been um, the feedback that we're getting so far is that's really effective. So less paper and more talking, more action, um, you know, the impact of being able to think from <laughs> everyone's own experience. And for the trainers not to be seen as total experts on everything, but facilitating discussion and sharing learnings and um, giving everyone a sense of empowerment. Um, so I think that's the way that we're tackling it um, within, within our program. 
Martin? Yeah. Um, I think, and that's a great example, Karen, of what I think as a principle, um, I'd say to shift our thinking and shift our gaze from, um, with, from having women at the centre of our um, work to having marginalised women at the centre. So if you can imagine, you know, kind of a pie or something, <laughs> um, and you've got your women in the centre and then all the marginalised women on the outside, um, shift it all around and move those women from the centre out to the margins and the marginalised women into the centre and see how that um, changes your practice. And, and it would. It means that you've got to use very different <coughs> strategies when you're doing training or it means that you, you really um, have a very different approach to the work that you're doing. And, and I think that other second point about keeping all this complexity in your head, it's not easy, um, but it can be done and you're not going to get there the first time, but just keep trying. And you'll, it, it's about what you're working towards, I guess. So don't think, oh, well, I'm not going to solve the problems of the world with this particular program, but I'm actually going to get closer to um, that world that I'm imagining uh, by doing this program. And um, going on from that, Adele, that is about keeping that complexity in mind. And I don't think that's something that we're, um, we've got our heads around yet. But it is kind of a really exciting place to be. Like today is actually quite an exciting opportunity. But if you think about where we've got to in Victoria in particular, um, since the investment that Vic Health did in the 29 projects back in 2007, um, there wasn't a lot of diversity in those 29 projects. Um, but at the same time, they've been hugely important in building the momentum about mainstream um, services such as local government getting absolutely on board with the issue of preventing violence against women and more recently, um, gender equity. Um, that's now um, a, a train that isn't going to stop. Like We are actually on a really exciting um, journey with that. But I don't think we've actually manage the diversity lens at all well yet. Um, I've been looking at a lot of um, council plans and um, regional strategies for preventing violence against women and really Aboriginal women, women with disabilities, um, same sex attracted and culturally diverse is a, an other, it really is still an other. Mm -hmm. And we have a, you know, a 30 page document that has one reference to disability, one reference to cold, um, so we've got a long way to go until we've actually got a, a more sophisticated um, and challenging kind of approach. However, I would also say that the, the, the achievements of the last you know, eight or nine years, not disrespecting the feminism and the 30 years before it, but certainly in my, um, the last decade that I've kind of been around the local government and violence against women's space, um, it has been just um, leaps and bounds that I've just witnessed um, leaders emerging everywhere um, and really great practice like Karen's um, training. I know how successful that's been for women with disabilities and, and professional trainers. Um, I guess the issue with that is it's, um, it's time consuming and it, and it is small steps. There's been some beautiful projects with um, uh, in the um, culturally and linguistically diverse um, sector with working with women as leaders and, and mentoring, but it's resource intensive. Um, and so that's where I guess we've gone for the, the big ticks on, you know, the easier kind of, um, you know, um, easier actions, I guess. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, um, I, I'm, thank you again, Adele and Karen, for your presentations because I, this is an area that um, I feel uh, very humbled by and very challenged by and, and one that I think, that, you know, that we've got so much to learn in. Um, and the particular challenge I think we, we as the foundation face right now is we were established uh, by those two governments it, with recognition that not, I think not enough work had been done in prevention um, on intersectionality, although that wasn't the, word, the wording that was used. So the sort of wording that, we, that was used, and I think it came from all, all the goodwill in the world, is, is we need to look at uh, how we prevent violence against vulnerable groups, you know, particularly mm -hmm. at risk and vulnerable, and in that box was put Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women and their children, culturally and linguistically diverse women and their children, and we've talked about that language before, <laughs> I don't know, I know you don't like it. 
um, and women with disabilities. And um, I've always, I've never liked the language of vulnerability and risk, and I think this is probably you to educate me on why. Um, because it's not, for me, although there may be greater experiences of violence, there's this sense for me that it's not a, it's not your, your disability that puts you at greater risk of violence, it's the discrimination, it's the disadvantage, it's the, all those systemic and attitudinal factors that are contributing to it, and the same for other forms of, of, of uh, any other identity characteristics. So I, I think there's a challenge to try and shift into that, exactly that intersectionality, keep the focus of putting women and, and into groups that are divided up in, in these sort of hermetic senses, um, you can only be Aboriginal or have a disability, you can't have, you know, or be both. Um, and look instead at uh, the circumstances that are creating the, the, those ex particular experiences of violence, and that's the intersectionality. So for me, um, just going on a bit, I'm aware, sorry, that having some guiding principles for how to do that, I think, is, is really important, and I love this idea of putting um, the margin to the centre is a great one. Another one I think I learned off Karen is meaningful participation in everything. So we um, have been funded to do a project that's just the call for expressions of interest has just been released for um, two culturally and linguistically diverse communities. And I, I, I just want to make sure that it's the communities themselves and the women themselves in particular in those communities who are developing the implementation plans for that work. Um, but as we go forward and develop this national framework, I think there's a hell of a lot more thinking that we need to do and analysis to draw on um, for how we do this. So, yeah, how do you approach it with humility and openness and willingness to learn, I think. Mm. We could probably do well with that advice in the lot of things, Lara. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you very much for that, and I certainly, myself, and probably other people feel like it's interesting to this group matter away back into hours because they're just bringing so much knowledge uh, to the room. The second question is, this is an easy one, how do you demonstrate primary prevention efforts are delivering change? <laughs> Perhaps, Larry, you'd like to start with that since we've got national foundation. Thanks. Um, all right, so I think there's a whole lot of different levels at which this operates. Can you explain it to them, Larry? All right, so what, I think we're, we're, where we're at now with prevention is that we have um, Okay. We've talked about the underlying causes, we're pretty clear that we know what some of those underlying causes are, but with all of those caveats that we have to think about the intersections. Is my microphone drooping? Um, you know, race, uh, class, uh, you know, disability and so forth. Um, we have seen initiatives, many, many initiatives, including uh, a lot here in, in Victoria and in Australia, that have demonstrated uh, change against those underlying causes. That is, you have an initiative, say, in the school, um, and you do pre-tests and post-tests, and after it, you can see that the students' attitudes have changed towards gender, uh, that their behaviours have changed, you might have uh, different practices in the school that are operating. Same for initiatives in workplaces, like this got up there, in, in uh, faith groups, in, in sporting organisations, council businesses, and so forth. Um, internationally, there have also been uh, programs that have been evaluated longitudinally, so have followed the same participants in the programs, a bit like the uh, Life at Nine thing that's on TV at the moment, um, over the years to see what longer term impact it has had on them. And there are, there's now a, about a dozen or so programs of different sorts, um, started with schools programs, that have demonstrated that participants in these particular programs have gone on to uh, perpetrate less violence and to experience less violence. So that's sort of very important, that's, and that's against a control group. These sorts of evaluations cost a fortune, that's why they're so rare, um, but they're quite important because they show that we're having an impact on these actual sort of levels of violence down the, down the track. Um, what we, so we, we, that's all the, the evidence we have. We have this sort of, I suppose, patchwork of we know it can work to address underlying causes, we know some of them work to actually reduce future perpetration or experience of violence. But what we don't yet have in any country in the world is evidence of whole of population change. So that goes to the point I brought up before, if we haven't yet taken prevention to scale and we haven't yet started to really measure the impacts of prevention activities at a, at a bigger level than the participants of programs. All of our evaluations so forth have been so far have been really at that program level. So I think the big challenge for us in, in Australia now is to think about, okay, how are we going to monitor this at a national level? 
um, and not to fall into the trap of thinking we're going to see results really quickly because it goes back to this idea of it's a very uh, deeply entrenched problem. I think it will be, I think we might be able to see changes against attitudes, um, behaviours and practices, those sort of middle level ones in, in maybe a decade. I wouldn't expect to see changes against actual prevalence figures, perpetration or experience, we don't measure perpetration, but experience. I wouldn't imagine we'd see that um, within 10 years. We might see it, I, I would hope, in the decade that follows. But we, have, we actually have no template for this. This is where we can get on. Thank you, Laura. Um, again, um, I'm thinking about in the local government capacity, we've certainly um, <coughs> introduced programs and strategies that has increased gender equity. And I think there's um, many examples where you can demonstrate how um, investment has occurred and um, whether that's in you know, the 2010 year of women in local government and we saw a 6.5% increase in elected women um, and a massive, uh, no council now without any female councillors for the first time. Um, and there's also many workplaces that have got strategies around gender equity that has greatly um, increased women's leadership um, status within organisations, which has been really significant. However, again, I'm not sure about, like, Lara said that we haven't got um, the prevalence um, data and I think most of the actions that have happened in a local government setting have been um, actions of, on, based on good assumptions, based on the big health framework that if we put A and B in place we can hope to see. But I think it is still very much now still at the um, you know, awareness raising and embedding gender equity principles across the organisation. Um, I think again with the Women's Health Services and their work on regional strategies, it is going to be about putting things in place that are based on the evidence that we have and um, with the intention that it will have an impact on women's um, equity um, and organisational capacity to um, build gender equity. But I'm really not sure in the life of the two years or the four years are we going to be able to say um, other than at an individual participant level, what difference um, it's actually made on a larger scale. But I just think the, the actions that we put into place based on best practice that we know um, from the evidence base that exists and with the assumptions that if we put these things in place and, um, and, and, and base our work on those principles that we will be contributing to um, the overall goal of preventing violence against women. But I think it's more evident in gender equity being embedded in organisations at this point in time. Thanks. Could I just do a little interjection? Just because I, I, I worry, I, and I think that's enti entirely valid, and I think that that's, um, that's exactly right. Like, I, don't, I didn't, I suppose what I wanted to say is I don't, I, I'm focusing at the national level because that's the organisational mandate, that's the next challenge. But we can be very confident that if we address what has been confidently <laughs> identified as underlying causes in gender and equity and so forth, that we are on the right path. So I actually think it's very important that we measure change at those levels, and I think they're really important changes. Um, yeah, uh, thank you for, for those insights. Um, I'm, my strength is new evaluation. <laughs> but if I could um, just contribute something about how intersectionality also kind of has some insights in relation to evaluation. Uh, I think that if whatever we are able to measure, whether it's over 10, 20, 50 years, um, if we aren't measuring uh, attributes that are related to marginality, so if we're not, we, we are looking at you know, how many women have we got in parliament or local government, but we're not also measuring how many of those women are from migrant and refugee backgrounds, how many of them are women with disabilities, um, we're not actually getting the, the data that we need to know that our intersectional approach might be working or not. Um, so I think that element is really important when we're measuring. And, and I think the other thing, and this is a bit of a downer, so I'm sorry about this, but um, it's great to measure attitudinal change because that's telling us whether our programs are having the impact that we want them to have. Um, but then we've also got the structure, which is you know, the policy legislative level. 
Uh, and in specifically in relation to migrant and refugee women, we can kind of go in there and talk to communities and change their attitudes. But if we've got immigration policy yeah. that then limits women's capacity to act or, it, um, you know, temp women on temporary visas, they, they um, you know, have very limited capacity to act in a situation of violence or to, um, you know, it, the policy itself brings women into situations where they're more subject to violence. So. Um, the attitude was really important, we've got to measure it. Um, perhaps at the same time we need to measure the legislative and, and you know, the stuff that kind of goes alongside it and sits above it that, so that we're not thinking, well, if this isn't having an impact on prevalence rates, then um, it's not because we're not yeah. trying, we're not doing the right things, but it's because we've got the policy, the, the high level systemic stuff that's mitigating against that being effective. So. <coughs> I uh, agree. Uh, that's a really important point. Um, you know, with our program, we're looking at measuring at an organisational level, so like down at that direct service level, and we're looking for the effectiveness of organisational change in culture um, as a measure. But that's still quite an ambitious measure for a program that's got two years of funding. Uh, so we're looking at more short-term effects rather than the long term and we hope to get additional funding so that we can continue to measure the long term impact of the work that we're doing. Um, but we're very conscious uh, in the way we've designed the program that it's not just about training, it is about um, what are the, what are the uh, participants in the training are going to take back to the organisation and what actions are they going to put in place. We work with the supervisors around um, them being aware of the actions and supporting those actions. We have communities of practice, but we have two communities of practice sessions um, following on to look at how that's worked. But what we're identifying in the actions is people saying, we need to look at our quality framework and how gender is measured within our quality framework. So if we can get that to happen, then we're starting to get some organisational change. So some of it is, um, uh, random, I think. You can't measure everything within this kind of program without, as you say, a big investment funds over a longer period of time. Okay. But, you know, the feedback that we're getting from our, um, from our trainers and also from the participants is that they are finding the learnings quite significant. Mm -hmm. And if we can reinforce that through our um, communities of practice, then Hopefully that will continue to self-reinforce. 